Good morning, members. Good morning, viewing public. Good morning, members of my committee and members of the esteemed bodies that we invited here today. Today, I must welcome you all and wish you all a very uh, productive and a prosperous new year because I think this is the first meeting a joint select committee is having in this new year. And I would like to welcome you, know, you to the first virtual public hearing of the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA of the 12th Parliament. And I would like to just mention to uh, members, please, you know, there are certain guidelines for virtual meeting. Please remember that you would ensure that you, you mute your microphone when you are not speaking to keep the background noise to a minimum, adjust your cameras, you know, so we can clearly see you visible, and also ensure that your cell phone or the electronic device uh, does, uh, would not um, disturb the proceedings. And members of the listening and viewing audience, you are invited to post or send comments via the Parliament's various social media platforms, Facebook page, PalView, Parliament's YouTube channel, and Twitter. So as you send those um, questions or any comments, the Secretariat here will be able to pull it and bring it into the meeting so we'll get a wider participation from the members of the public. At this stage, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Varma Dialsing, an independent senator and chair of this committee. And I am... Um, it's a pleasure to welcome members of the airport's authorities of Trinidad and Tobago, the Ministry of Works and Transport, and the Ministry of Health. And at this stage, I would like if the members of the airport's authority could please introduce themselves for the viewing public. Would Mr. Hayden Newton, General Manager, start, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any members of the airport's authority, could you please introduce yourselves? Put on your hand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, yes. Chairman. Yeah, here, I'm hearing you. Right. Loud and clear. Mm -hmm. This is Hayden Newton. I'm the general manager of the airport's authority of Toronto Tobago. It's a pleasure to have you on board, Hayden. Thank yes, you for next. inviting us, um, and I'll ask the other members of my team to introduce themselves. Sure, thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members. My name is Albert Griffith. I'm the Deputy General Manager of Security at the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Sure. Is it Colonel or Mr? Colonel. Okay, Colonel, welcome aboard. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Good Any morning, other member? Chairman. Yeah, sure. Morning, Chairman members. Morning. I'm the Deputy General Manager of Operations with the Airport. Pleasure to have you on board. And I think there's a Mrs. Scotland Benjamin. Good morning, Chairman and members. Pamela Scotland Benjamin, the Deputy General Manager of Operations at ANR Robinson International Airport. Thank you for being here. Are there any other members of your committee present? That's it. Okay. Could we now go to the Ministry of Works and Transport and start in with Ms. Danmati Ramda, the Permanent Secretary. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning, Chair, and your, your esteemed team, and to my colleagues from the Airports Authority. I am Danmati Ramda, um, Acting Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Works and Transport at this time. And thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. And I think it's Mr. Hiralal. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Jarad Hiralal. I'm the Director of Environment, Health and Safety Unit at the Ministry of Works and Transport. Thank you and welcome. Ministry of Health, could I have introductions? Started with Dr. Parasram, our esteemed CMO. Hi, good morning, um, Chair and members. Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for being here. 
Um, are there any other doctors? Dr. Fraser? Is Dr. Fraser yes. on board? Good. Good, good morning. Good morning, Chair and all the other members. Um, Dr. Osafa Fraser, Acting County Medical Officer of Health for St. George East, with responsibility for Piaco Airport, Port Health. Good. And I think you have one more officer on board. Hi. Doctor. Yes. Hi, morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Tiffany Hoyt, the Acting County Medical Officer of Health for Tobago. Thank you for being here. And now I would like to introduce members of my team, starting with uh, Mrs. Lisa Morris Julian. Mr. Esmond Ford. Hi, good morning, colleagues. Morning. Esmond Ford, member of welcome. Happy New Year to all. And, and Mr. Ford, for the members, is also the deputy chair. So welcome, Mr. Ford. Um, would Mrs. Yeah. Ayana Webster Roy introduce, please? Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year, Ayana Webster Roy member. Morning, thank you. Uh, Ms. Khadija Amin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Khadija Amin, member of the committee. Thank you. Mr. Nigel DeFreitas. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year, Thank Member Nigel. Thank you, Mr. DeFaitas, the Vice President of the Senate, and also Mrs. Jayanti Lachmidial. Hi, good morning, everyone. Jayanti Lachmidial. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here, and Happy New Year to everyone. Good. So, thank Chairman, you. Your Ms. Show. Morris, Julian, just saying good morning. I couldn't find oh. the, the... Hi, good morning. Morning. Good morning. morning. Nice to see you. Yes. So thank you, team, for being here, and thank you, members Chairman, of the If I might respectfully interject, you forgot a member. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to say the ministry Is of... Because of, my of, name is the longest name general. on the list. Yes. <laughs> so, Ms. Ranuka Sagram Singh Suklal, could you... Yeah. Us, you know, yeah. Yes, Chairman. Uh, pleasant good morning to all through you, Chairman. I would also like to take the opportunity to wish my colleagues a very happy new year and also to personally thank the most esteemed team that appears before our committee today. No doubt uh, each of these uh, um, organizations has played a crucial part in protecting our country thus far from this dreadful pandemic. So through you, Chairman, I would also like to send my special thank you to the team for protecting us thus far. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we got a, uh, the chairman of the ATT wanted to also mention something. You had your hand raised. Chairman? Yes, sure. Yes, um, I, I just want to ind indicate that there's another member of my team who was not introduced. My financial oh. controller is also here, Ms. Kamala Wallace Shanklin. Okay, sure. Could uh, could we um could we get a visual if if, if possible? If not, is it? Okay, okay. So we we'll just indicate. Yeah. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah. I'm Carmela Wallace Chandler, the financial controller of the Airport Authority, and Happy New Year, and God bless to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Ms. Wallace. So at this stage, um, I would like to just mention the objectives of this inquiry. It's really four things we are looking at. One, to assess the health and safety policies, systems, and protocols implemented by the AATT to mitigate the risk associated with operating the country, the country's two international airports. Two, to assess the risk management strategies employed by the AATT in the implementation of its COVID-19 plans. Three, to examine the adequacy of the AATT's human resource resources to implement the identified COVID-19 policies, systems, and protocols. And four, to assess the gaps in the AATT's COVID-19 strategy. So I think we all realize that we play, this committee plays a very important part in what is going on globally. We have seen the COVID response in our country 
um, in the sense that we had great challenges. And so far, we are very fortunate to have on board the CMO and the Minister of Health, who did a very excellent job in curtailing and controlling this um, spread of this pathogen. However, with the new mutation of this COVID virus, it now leaves us to wonder, um, are we in for a greater a challenge that you know, we will be facing? Because since it's reared its head in South Africa four months ago, and the UK now is actually having a very tough time with this new strain, which spreads very rapidly, I think the CMO would agree with me that if this comes to our country, we would have a major, major challenge in terms of the strain to our health system. So the, the, the airport authority um, plays a very crucial role in preventing the spread of this in our country. And this is why this, um, the, our purpose today is to get any sort of shortcomings, any sort of ways that we can serve to uh, beef up the activities, to help the activities of the airport's authority. Because what the Ministry of Health has done so far, their success, a failure at the ports could you know, lead to some disaster. So I now would like to ask um, members of the various committees to give some brief opening remarks. And I would like to start with Mr. Hayden Newton, the general manager of AATT, please. Chairman uh, and members, we want to, in fact, thank you for inviting us to this inquiry. We think it's very important. The Airport Authority remains firmly set on our path towards contributing to the stimulation of national, the national economy and through promoting diverse and innovative aviation business and fulfilling our mandate to provide safe and secure aviation services at both our airport estates. When the COVID-19 pandemic emerged in 2020, the authority was presented with a challenge that impacted the aviation business and the aviation sector uniquely. But we have, been, we have seen this kind of things before in terms of the situation that occurred with respect to things such as H1N1, SARS, MARS and Ebola. Of course, this challenge is a different type of challenge, but the fact is that given, given that we have seen challenges in terms of pathogens in which affected aviation in the past, the airport authority would have had certain systems in place guided by the Ministry of Health in terms of dealing with these kind of challenges. The airport environment is a complex ecosystem with the need for fervent coordination and collaboration with stakeholders being very important. The authority does solidify its partnership with our key stakeholders and engage in a rigorous consultative process to develop COVID-19 response strategies. The aviation business is fundamentally one of risk management. With this new threat, we have been guided primarily by the Ministry of Health and have employed a layered approach to safety and robust risk mitigation systems that involve physical distancing protocols, increased cleaning and sanitization, and stringent protective measures for employees and travelers, to name a few. The authority also operates with a, within a strict local and international regulatory environment and framework, and is further guided by the industry standards and recommended procedures of the international bodies. Added to this, we have relied heavily on the expertise of international organizations such as the Airport Council International, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and a network of other affiliated or worldwide organizations to ensure that we have implemented best practices in airports management in Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to this issue of the COVID-19 pathogen. Our efforts have been recognized by ACI, the Airport Council International, as both our airports have received international airport health accreditation, which signifies that our airport safety programs and health safety protocols are in line with the International Civil Aviation Organization's requirements and recommendations. Our COVID-19 measures are aimed to keep all our stakeholders safe at our facilities. We strive to safeguard public trust and confidence in our health and safety mechanisms. Our COVID-19 response has been a delicate balance balancing act of implementing safe health and safety strategy while at the same time ensuring as seamless and as efficient as possible passenger journey. 
Now, despite the closing, the official closure of our borders in March 2020, we still continue to facilitate cargo operations, domestic travel, and arriving and departing international repatriation flights. This has allowed us to continually assess and test our measures. The situations remain fluid. As it evolves, we continue to adjust and reevaluate our systems. In the midst of it, the authority has had to respond to several voices. We have had to adequately respond to the voices of our employees, our unions, our regulators, government agencies, concessionaires, airlines, suppliers, business partners, and of course, the traveling public. The agility of the organization has enabled us to, to respond positively and to ensure continuous operations. Chairman, the authority stands ready to answer your questions, and we look forward to the recommendation of this esteemed committee to assist us in dealing with this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. I, I guess we have gotten some of our answers already from that discourse, but at, at least we will need to go in more to look in the background, any sort of questions people will have or concerns, because as you understand, you there's a very important role you play now in protecting our country. I would like now to go on to uh, um, some opening remarks from Ms. Danmati Ramda, the Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Works and Transport. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, permit me to welcome my colleagues from Ministry of Health as well in this. Um, and I feel privileged that we will be, the, we are the first uh, virtual meeting that we are having for the Joint Select Committee. So thank you. As a general rule, the Ministry of Works and Transport executes its mandate to maintain oversight of the operations of the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. In accordance with the guidelines iterated in the State Enterprises Performance Manual. Further, it should be noted that the authority is required to operate within its relevant legislative framework. That is the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 4902, which dictates the planning and operations of the organization. Since the onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic and the subsequent closure of the international borders as a preventative mechanism to curb the spread of the virus, the ministry has closely collaborated with the airport authority in respect of its funding requirements and other statutory approvals required for the continuity of the latter's business operations. While the ministry is keenly aware of the financial challenges that this unprecedented public health emergency has presented to the airport authority and by extension the country, the perseverance of the authorities management and staff as highlighted in the Mr. Newton's opening remarks in responding to the health and safety guidelines remains an impressive feat. In particular, the ministry notes with great pride the authorities' remarkable achievement of the Airports Council International's accreditation of the country's two international airports in respect of the COVID-19 response and the application of the required health and safety protocols. The, this achievement is particularly important given that it is the first of its kind for the Caribbean region. The ministry's team and I thank you for this opportunity to present at today's session and look forward to addressing any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, yes. for that um, discourse there and the, uh, clearing up the legislation, pieces of legislation which governs the, your overview of the airport's authority. At this stage, I would like to welcome and also ask the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasham, who I must also congratulate for having the Express Individual of the Year Award. Very, very worthy person to get that award. You've been in the hearts and minds of a lot of persons. And I would like you, please, if you can introduce and say a few um, opening remarks, please. Okay, thank you again, Chair and members. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Ministry's team, we welcome the opportunity again um, to be part of this inquiry into health and safety practices and arrangements at the airport's authority, both in Trinidad and Tobago. I think um, 
key to public health in terms of the country as you started the discussion on the new strain in particular is that one, the airports in both islands not serve as a hub for harborage of the pathogen, meaning stringent sanitization, hand hygiene, and all other public health measures should be abided by, including wearing of masks, while both passengers and staff utilize the airports. Um, in some countries around the world, we have persons not wearing masks, not providing that level of um, safety and security for both the passengers and the staff at the airports. And we see it as a key objective of both the airports authority and the Ministry of Health and other agencies to ensure that persons don't actually contract the virus while they enter and leave the airport. Um, critically as well, uh, one of the functions of public health at the airport is to detect cases of suspected infection early. And a lot of health education and promotion has gone along to try to do that, um, both to the passengers and the staff. Again, to protect the, the staff by ensuring the necessary PPE is available to staff. And the Ministry of Health provides the necessary training for those individuals on the staff of airports authority as they need be to ensure that they wear their PPE appropriately and at all times they know how to follow the public health measures. Recognizing early that the airport is critical for our function, although it has been closed on March 23rd, we of course took a number of steps. So as the committee may be aware, there was the establishment of a multi-sectoral committee to deal with COVID-19 and other dangerous infections in Trinidad and Tobago in the early quarter, first quarter of 2019. Out of that committee, we established on July 3rd, I believe, um, a subcommittee that deals specifically with the reopening of the Trinidad and Tobago borders. Now, on the subcommittee, we have a number of members, um, quite a number of members from the Ministry of Health. We had it chaired by the Principal Medical Officer of Epidemiology at the time. We had Dr. Hines, who is the lead epi epidemiologist, Dr. Fraser, Dr. Hoyt, who is with us today from Tobago. We had a legal representative from the ministry. From other departments, we thought communication would be play a significant role. And we had a representative from both the ICT division of the ministry, as well as the Ministry of Communication. Civil Aviation, of course, was represented. Immigration Division, the Caribbean Airlines, two representatives, Defense Force, Police Service, and of course, the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the subcommittee was set up with a view to of course, ensure that the necessary PP was available to the staff at the airport and training. The signage and quarantine forms were in place very early on in the epidemic. The quarantine arrangements that were put in place, as Mr. Newton would have indicated, for the repatriation of nationals were in place, and all protocols were being followed to decrease the risk of importation of COVID-19 and, of course, the new strain as we go forward, and any other necessary recommendations, meaning any structures that needed to be put in place, both in Port Health and outside, for example, the setting up of the infrared cameras that would have required to be put in very early on in the epidemic to determine if febrile passengers were coming in. So I think the committee set up, set up that committee early on, recognizing that if and when we reopen, and again, I mean, really, really, I think this committee that is set up to look into the health and safety practices is crucial, and we will give our full support um, and we hope that today's proceedings will insightfully bring more meaning to what we have already started at the Airports Authority and the Ministry of Health, as well as the Ministry of Work, to, to actually push ahead with our plans going into 2021. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Parasram. And I, you had mentioned some concerns that the, you know, the challenges faced to get persons to actually comply with the guidelines. And I think this is a challenge that was, um, uh, you know, expressed also by the Minister of Health and our Prime Minister, certain persons not obeying. Now, with this, uh, Dr. Parasam, with this new strain of the uh, virus that is around, if we were thinking about opening our borders in a, a certain time frame, would that now um, further, um, you know, that opening uh, 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 date. Did you have any date in mind at, the, at any time? Did your subcommittee consider any date? And now with this trail, would that now push back the opening of the borders? Yeah, so, so the subcommittee would have had a sort of um, rolling date to consider. I think early on, we, have, we had all thought by September or thereabouts in the world that the pandemic will be 
um, declining significantly in various countries. And what we thought is that we should have taken a staggered approach, meaning for countries that would have been listed by WHO as having no cases or sporadic cases, we could have had possibly opening up the borders to those countries in the first instance, where we would have said in the requirement that you have to be in that territory for 14 days or more before coming to Trinidad, meaning that you would have been in a low-risk territory, thereby allowing a phased reopening of the border to occur. Now, with, with recent, um, what has happened with the new strain is that, of course, we have seen a spike in many countries in the UK, Canada, um, as well as Australia, and across Europe, which really has put a, a little bit of a damper on the way we were planning to reopen the border. Of course, the decision ultimately lies with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. But we will make our recommendations based, of course, on the um, looking at the new strain. What we know so far from the research is that it seems to be more than 50% more infectious in nature, which, of course, means that it can spread from one person to the next much more quickly. And we have seen large countries, first world countries, being overrun very quickly by the new strain, um, example being the UK in particular. In the south part of England, their hospitals are now overrun. They are over 100% capacity. So again, it, it seems like we're starting over somewhat in the middle, in the beginning of this new year, looking at, looking at the new strain and having significant concerns, much like what we had last year when we saw this thing evolving in China. Um, so our concern is renewed again in 2021, that you know, we really have to take it one step at a time, look at, how, look at, look at what is happening with the spread internationally, and again, our, our first aim at this point is to contain the virus, this new strain as well, keeping it out of the country. Hence the reason we had always maintained a state or state supervised quarantine period. I know we have at the ministry come under a lot of scrutiny for doing so. And persons would have wanted to go home, but we have always maintained the possibility of a new strain always was at the back of our minds. And now we're seeing with this new strain having increased infectivity that it is a real concern and we will maintain our quarantine position for now, um, look to see where else it's spreading and of course advise the Prime Minister and the other members as to what next steps will be taken with regards to quarantine and the airport. Uh, Dr. Paras, um, since this strain is so easily, um, well, can spread so easily, I am thinking, and since we have already established some members of the public are not very, uh, you know, aware or, or, of the danger and, and, and simply don't even bother about the, the protocols. Now, presently, there's this seven-day policy where you stay in a state quarantine and you allow seven days at home. Will you want to revise that and put a 14-day a quarantine in a state institution where you now will be able to have a greater scrutiny of those individuals and you know not knowing which one will if they go home they may breach that um a home order right so so certainly um we have already revised it as you know for the uk so persons coming in from the united kingdom at this time or anybody spending who would have been 14 days prior in the uk now have to revert back to 14 days in a state or state supervised facility to give us that added level of assurance that, that they are being monitored in a facility and there's decreased risk of spread of the new um, strain. However, in recent times, we have learned that almost 38 countries around the world have, have now recorded the new strain. So of course, there has to be a revision in the way we do the quarantine for other countries as well. And it, it is a matter of a discussion with the Prime Minister in the coming days. Mr. Chair, might I... Um... Might I jump in and ask a question? Sure, Mr. Defeatus. Okay. Um, good morning to everyone again. Uh, the question I have is in light of this new strain. And when this entire thing started, uh, we didn't have much information on the virus itself. We were trying to gather that information in terms of, you know, how it spread, if it's airborne, if it's not airborne. And I'm hearing that this new strain is 50% um, is more infective, but it's coming at a time when we would have already implemented things like mask wearing, sanitizing of hands, and sanitizing of surfaces. And we are seeing that it's still spreading quite fast. So my question is, given the fact that this new strain has emerged and it's 50% more uh, infective, what um, is the airport authority, you know, what can they do to sort of increase protection in relation to this new strain. Uh, 
Hello. 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 Yeah. Hello. Yes, uh, did, you, did, did you all hear the question? Hello. Yes, we did. Yes. Okay. So just looking for an answer. What what can be done given that certain protocols have been put in place already? Um, given that we are on a year into this pandemic, now there's a new strain that's 50% more infective. So I'm asking what is the response of the airport authority given that we still have the mask wearing taking place, the hand sanitizing and the sanitizing of surfaces, but now you have a strain that's more infective and it seems to be spreading quite rapidly in other countries. What can the airport authority do on top of what is already being done to add more protection? Um, thank you. Um, what I, the airport authority's response would be, uh, all of our responsiveness, responsiveness to this COVID-19 has been guided by the Ministry of Health in terms of those specific, because they, they are the experts. So, so far we have put in place a rigorous um, situation in terms of sanitizing and that kind of thing, but all of that has been guided by the Ministry of Health. We will, in fact, um, as a part of the normal consultative collaborative process, be guided and be liaison with the Ministry of Health to determine if we, in fact, have to be much more vigorous in terms of what specifically we have to do. Because our, our business really is in terms of aviation. The issue in terms of the communicable diseases and those kind of things, we are guided by the Ministry of Health. So we will, we will fall back on the Ministry of Health in terms of assisting us, in terms of making sure that we are able to deal with this challenge, this additional challenge. Okay, so let me ask Dr. Parasaram now, given the fact that um, it seems that this new variant is 50% more infective, what else can be done on top of what is already being done for the past year to sort of, you know, help in relation to what we are seeing worldwide? Okay, so <clears throat> within the airports itself, um, basically we have to ensure that, that the systems we have in place are functioning effectively, meaning sanitization is happening, you have the social distancing, the way we treat with passengers, trying to get them in and out of the airport in a very quick time has to happen. However, what we don't know as yet is we don't know what is leading to the, to the increased infectivity, whether it is increased potential for aerosolization, whether it is some change in the virus that is causing um, persons to now be able to pick it up more readily from fomites, which are inanimate objects. Um, so research has to be done to determine if any of those parameters have changed with this new strain. Suggestively early on, maybe not. Um, but again, it, it, it only time will tell into the next couple of weeks. If, of course, just theoretically, you find that it is now aerosolized, for example, what would it would mean is that the type of mask that we are wearing will not be as effective. So we will recommend a higher level of mask in terms of filtration. So we will probably have to recommend N95 masks to persons who are in high risk. Um, we haven't got that research on evidence to suggest that we should do so at this point. Um, so we continue with the surgical masks and the other masks for, for non-clinical staff. But if we get that data, then of course we will amend to suit. Um, similarly, in terms of the surfaces, using our alcohol-based sanitization as well as possibly bleach as an alternative um, seems to be adequate for now. Again, it just means that we need to have to be a little more rigorous, making sure that what needs to be done is being done appropriately. Um, checks and balances, for example, making sure there's a, there's a, in terms of the operations, making sure there's a checklist that someone, a supervisor will ensure that our service is sanitized every hour or thereabouts, or even more frequently depends on the use. So the vigilance has to be a somewhat increased, I would suspect at the airport and the quarantine that um, Dr. Bial Singh has asked about is most critical because even after, I mean, you're in transit through an airport for a very short period of time. You come out, what happens after is where we're going to catch the virus in terms of changing. So possibly looking at a lengthening quarantine back to the 14 days is our best bet in containment through the ports of entry, um, at least the legitimate ports of entry for now. Dr. Parasam, I want to just ask a question. Do you also would recommend like uh, like a eye shield for persons going on airplanes or even working in the environment, as well as the mask, right? So, right. so, so again, um, for we recommend persons in high risk environments, in hospitals, for example, to wear both both levels of protection. 
because there's an increased risk of aerosolization of the virus coming into the air. Therefore, there's an increased risk of it getting into your system through the mucosal membrane of your eye. Um, so we will recommend sometimes in hospital, you will find people wearing a shield plus a surgical mask in those instances, or, or a shield plus an N95 mask is essential for places, for example, when they do intubation of patients and those sorts of things. Um, at this point, again, the, the data is, um, it will add another level of protection for the individual. So if persons wish to do so, that, that is fine um, to protect their eyes. But it, again, is something early on we're seeing with the new strain. When we get research to see what is happening and why it is more effective, then we'll be in a better position to guide further. For this existing strain, we don't recommend it at this point in time, unless you are in a very high risk environment. Sure, I was just um, thinking if you're coming in an airplane with sure. that enclosed environment, even though they have the HEPA system of filtration, uh, you know, the, the normal goggles that you can get, I think some people had mentioned may offer that. So this is something I think your committee may have to look into. One okay. other question I'd have to ask though, there, there is the idea of the um, aviation staff now they are going to be um, dealing with a flux of passengers. And there's the body called IATA, which suggested that aviation workers also be considered for first vaccination. Has anybody made any sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, recommendation to you to consider so, that? So yes, the, the, the persons that will get a first vaccination are the uh, Healthcare workers and other frontline workers. And when we when we say who the frontline workers are, we're looking at people, for example, in all the port health, um, immigration, customs. So all persons that work in a port, um, persons in the defense force, persons in the police service, persons in the fire service, as well as, uh, of course, all healthcare workers, meaning not only physicians and nurses, but anyone who works in a healthcare institution or in a geriatric home plus those who are over 60 years of age, anybody in the general population, as well as those who have non-communicable diseases. So those would be our phase one. I think the minister would have alluded to part one of phase one in a recent press conference, looking at the high-risk groups, which is healthcare workers on front lines, plus those over 60. I recognize, thank you, um, CMO. I recognize uh, uh, member Webster Royce. Okay, thank you again. Good morning. Let me first of all commend all our agencies for the excellent work thus far. My question is for Mr. Newton of the Airports Authority. Um, traversing between Trinidad and Tobago, I would notice that while we are in the departure launch, people would practice physical distancing, people would wear a mask. However, um, on the, in, in the environs of the airport, particularly in Tobago, and when we have periods of high travel, persons aren't practicing physical distancing. Persons have their mask on, but it's on the chin or on their forehead, not covering you know, their nose and their mouth. What I would like to know is the airport authority going to increase the number of officers on rotation to ensure we um, have persons follow the protocols and the guidelines and to ensure proper order at the airport, especially within the environs of the airport. Thanks. Thank you very much, Member. Um, the airport authority and the uh, staff of the airport authority has noted some of the same things that you have noted in terms of what given the increase in the domestic flights and um, this the situation as we said it's fluid and we recognize that that has started to happen so what we what we will be putting in place is an increase in terms of the amount of um, customer service staff and also security staff in terms of their going among the crowds, going among the people to make sure that we follow the social distancing requirements. Because we have seen it, we have, we have been monitoring it through the CCTV cameras, we've been monitoring it through on the ground, and we recognize that we have to make some adjustments there because with the additional domestic flights, we have seen the tendency to people not to be following the social distancing or, um, requirements and the mass requirements as, 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 as indicated by the Ministry of Health. So we will be increasing the, the vigilance in terms of the amount of people on the ground to make sure that, that this is done. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. How soon would we expect to see that happening? 
Well, it has actually, it has actually started from, we, we saw the situations over the weekend in terms of Tobago for in particular. And as a consequence of that, we have started to, in fact, ensure that we have more people on the ground. So it has exactly started right now. Thank you. Chair, can I, um, can I just jump in for a second? Sure, a question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if it's the airport or Ministry of Health would be um, that space to answer this, but in the submission from airports authorities, spoke about contact tracing. It was focused uh, primarily on employees working at the airports, but I just wanted to find out if we are to reopen and or even if we were to um, increase the number of flights coming in for repatriation and so on, um, is there... Do you think there's sufficient contact tracing with respect to persons coming through so that if you pick up a positive case, you can you can follow up with the contact tracing? And the second part of the question, uh, what about international contact tracing? Let's just say, um, in a very simple way, we find out that someone working at the BWI um, Caribbean Alliance counter in JFK or something tests positive. It would have been someone who might have interacted with everyone coming on a particular flight. Is there something in place for that information to very quickly get to us here and for the Ministry of Health to to get into contact tracing and um, to get on it, especially now with this new strain and how it has, uh, we're hearing that it's so much more um, infectious and can spread so much more quickly. So that's what, that was just too far. I don't know who would um, be able to address. Um, Chair, I think it, it lies with the Ministry of Health. Um, sure. So if I may, the... Interna as the international health regulation focal point, to answer your second question first, um, with regards to picking up international disease of concern for from another country and recognizing it in Trinidad, what happens is there's collaboration two ways. One, the, through the international health regulation focal points of, re of both countries, they normally should inform the receiving country, um, usually by email or phone call, of any event of concern. So if someone with COVID-19, for example, comes from Canada to Trinidad, they will inform us by email and by phone call through our PAHO partners, as well as directly as the International Health Regulation focal point, and then we pick that up. We reciprocate as well if somebody goes to another territory who is suspected COVID or confirmed COVID thereafter, we inform them as well. Um, in terms of the contact tracing that occurs in the airport, I wanted Dr. Fraser to go into a little bit of, this, of the operating procedures in the event that we do get a positive or a suspect case. How does he disseminate that to his colleagues at the various counties for them to continue the contact tracing outward as, as, as we go forward? So if Dr. Fraser. Sure. Just before Dr. Fraser, Dr. Parasram, um, when you said we and we would be informed, this, this entire process takes place through the Ministry of Health. I am, in, I am informed. I am the IHR focal point, so I am okay. informed directly as an individual. What happens is that the IHR network is a network of not necessarily CMOs, but each country has to, under PAHO, has to recommend to, to PAHO and WHO a person, an actual person, that is the International Health Regulation focal point, has a phone, phone number. What they do to ensure that the system is working is they actually do random calls throughout the year, twice or three times, and they do random emails as well. They used to do faxes when 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 fax, when fax was something that was used, and you have to respond, and they actually log your time for response. They log if you respond. So it's a network, global network of focal points that communicate with each other real time when events occur in different territories. So I am the focal point for Trinidad and Tobago. So I get notified directly when something occurs in the territory. Right. And given the COVID and, and what's happening now, do you have systems in place for as yourself as an individual being the focal point on your ministry by, or your department by extension to um, quickly disseminate that information back to persons like Airports Authority and, and so, the other so my, my, uh, my So when I get information of that nature that requires Airports Authority to be alerted, what we normally do is through the CMOHS in George East who is Dr. Okay. Fraser, I would right. send everything to him and he lays it to the, to the airports in Trinidad. And of course, Dr. Hoyt for Tobago will do the same in Tobago. So um, maybe Dr. Fraser could take us through what happens if we get a, a possible case and then you can get um, a clearer view of what is happening. Right. Dr. Fraser. Okay, thank, thank you, CMO. Um, I, I just want to focus the question upon the um, area of contact tracing of a positive case. 
Um, I apologize for the background, um, background noise. Um, all the all the cases that come on the on the flight, uh, the the information that we need as contact tracers uh, pertains to those people who are immediately surrounding the case, um, and that information is usually given to us by the airlines through the manifest. They will indicate to us who have been sitting closest to the individual, and that's usually two rows in front, two rows behind, and to the side. Those people are considered um, in the very first instance at those highest of risk and most exposed to the case. Um, those people would generally fill out a um, information that is collected by immigration authority. And then we would get that information from them indicating where they live, telephone numbers, um, and everything pertaining to them so that we can then follow through with the contact tracing. Um, you would imagine that if someone comes into the country, the people around them will be living in the disparate places, parts of, of Trinidad. Um, and we have a very good collaboration with all of the CMOs H who are responsible for the different counties. So once our office, St. George East office, responsible for Port Health in Piaco, once we get that information, we're able to quickly disseminate that to all of the CMOs H and then they will do um, more detailed contact tracing in their particular areas with those people who are living in, in the county. Um, we've had to do this several times from since March to now, and the system works very, 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 very well. Uh, we get lots of collaboration from the airlines and the airport authority, and um, the CMOS H network is a very um, tight network that allows for fast movement of information. Um, the other passengers who are on the flight, while they are not the ones immediately exposed and considered by all of the authorities, IATA, ICAO, um, WHO, PAHO, um, those persons are not generally considered um, at high risk once we are able to determine that the passenger, whether he or she, um, once, once they were contained to one section of the plane, did not have a very extensive time moving up and down all over the aircraft, once we are able to determine that, well, then those passengers who are sitting outside of the zone I mentioned are not considered the highest of risk, but we still do keep an eye on them and monitor for any changes um, over the next 14 days after they arrive. Just, uh, I mean, from a practical standpoint, though, what you mentioned there about the other passengers on the plane, is that really, I mean, is that something that's that's practical for you all to, to assess whether how, if someone... Uh, you pick up at someone who came in on a flight test positive, even though they had a negative PCR test and whatnot. Let's say they pick up that they tested positive three days after entering the country. Can you really, I'm just asking in practical terms, is it is it likely that you could determine how um, much they might have moved around on a plane three, four days before and how much interaction they would have had and how many times they use the bathroom and how many other people use that same bathroom on the plane. Yes, I mean, yes, how is it, yes, is that really yes. something that's. So, so usually, I mean, I know you're using three days as an example, but just for yeah. and, um, contact tracing usually starts two days before the person um, have arrived. So if it's three days, the persons on the plane would not have been considered in um, part of the infectious cycle. Um, but let's say the person arrived and we discovered two days later that they were indeed positive. Um, you're right, there is, a, there is a challenge, but we do get lots of very good information, both from the client themselves and from the um, car flight attendants who would have been um, on, on the plane observing them. And like I said, we've had to do this several, several times. Um, if we do have a situation where, and actually we've never really had a situation where the individual um, was found to be positive and had a very extensive time up and down the plane. But if we do, we would have to, by by um, by necessity, include a, everyone there in the quarantining process. We fortunately never really had to do that, but if we did, that is exactly what we would have to do. Do you think with the new strain and how uh, more uh, likely or how much more rapidly it's spreading, do you think that, that's, that, that those procedures you've outlined there would need any changes? Well, the good thing about what is happening now is that um, to come to Trinidad, you have to come with a negative PCR. So your, 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 your chances of being positive on a plane when coming to Trinidad is really, really very slim. Um, and so that, that requirement for a negative PCR to fly helps to mitigate people flying positive on the plane. 
Um, in the likelihood or the unlikely case that we do have um, someone who we discover days later is positive, well, then we would still have to do the extensive contact tracing required. But the, the current policy of ensuring people um, fly with a negative PCR is really helping to mitigate positive people on planes while they're flying. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. So, Doctor, you if you have a positive test, a negative test, right, you could still catch it within that short window period. And if somebody has a fever and they take Panadol tablets, will that not um, hide that um, uh, whole process and the scanners, the thermal scanners may not really pick it up? Is that a possibility that can happen? Yeah, so if you, get, if you have a negative PCR three days before you arrive, before you arrive, to pick up to pick up the virus within those three days, you are not going to be able to be infectious within a day of arriving. So your negative PCR three days before is actually very protective for us. So even if you picked up the virus a day before, for you to become infectious, it has to go through an incubation period. That incubation period is usually between two to fourteen days, and only then are you are you able to pass the virus on. So you are generally flying negative or non-infectious on the way once you've had a negative PCR at day three. Right. So, doctor, we can catch them in the in the period where we are locking down. I think that is the safe period, the fourteen-day period. Now Correct. we will catch Correct. those individuals. Correct. One other question I have, doc: the staff of the Cal Airlines or coming in are they screened um, in the countries that they are leaving to come in, or do they also have to undergo the same? Um, testing before they come to Trinidad? Sorry, I didn't get that question. The, the airline staff, for instance, Carl, um, airline staff, do they also have to take the test before they could board that plane to deal with passengers to come to our country? I mean, is that correct? Should that be directed to you or to the Carl um, medical um, protocol guidelines? I'm not sure if... <laughs> If, if it's directed you, or if you know the answer, if you can guide us. Generally, the, the well, and I would defer a, a more detailed answer to the Cal people, but just a, a general um, situation that obtains right now is that the Cal staff usually um, originate locally, and they will be the ones to fly up and down. Um, so they're not, they not generally coming from... Um, that is the Carl staff I can speak for. They're not, they're not coming from the US um, as, as working staff. So the, the staff that, that goes, that brings the clients down on the plane, their staff would have originated in Trinidad, flown, um, picked up, turned around, and brought people back. So those people would have been originating from, from a local, from locally. Thank you, Doc. Member Ford, you uh, have a question. Could you proceed? Thank you. A morning again, colleagues. Morning to the listening public. Again, I'd like to firstly um, congratulate the CMO, Dr. Roshan Paris Ram, and his team. You know, we, we see Dr. Paris Ram daily, but I know there's a team behind him, you know, that's doing human service to ensure that we remain safe in Trinidad and Tobago. My first question, Dr. Paris Ram, deals with the new stream, right? Um, an individual, I think it was a 20-year-old individual, got the, the virus in Colorado, USA. And when they did some contract tracing, they said that he did no travel. Could you just set, shed some light on the possibility of how he would have, the possibilities of how we could have gotten that new stream, especially in light that he did no travel and it was in the United States? Right. So... So when the new strain was picked up in UK, uh, I mean, there are theories that, of course, the UK started to do subtyping and picked it up first, simply because they were looking for it. Um, and again, it, it was picked up and was thought to be in circulation since September of 2020, which is a fair, fairly long period of time. We're looking at September, four months from the time that it was picked up to the time that we expect that it would have been in circulation. After that first case was picked up in UK, of course, we have noted in a number of other countries going all the way up to 38 countries now being infected or having confirmed cases of this same strain. And what we 
what it suggests, it suggests that it would be in other territories, including the U.S., and would have been there for some, some length of time be before they picked up their initial case. So, for example, in Colorado, the, the way that person would have gotten that particular strain is obviously they would have gotten it without travel from someone else in Colorado who would have had the strain. Generally speaking, subtyping, genetic subtyping is, is one, is a, it's a resource heavy process. It's, ex it's expensive to do, to actually go down to that level of typing um, as opposed to doing a PCR test. So it is costly and it is not something that you will do in a large proportion of the population, but you're checking for a subtype availability. So it's not like every PCR you do, you're gonna subtype. So they would have had cases, of course, I am sure that they have other cases in, in many other parts of the world we have not picked up as yet because the subtyping is not being done. Um, Jamaica being the latest that would have picked up four or five cases in recent times from, from UK passengers. But again, UK travelers were allowed to come and go from Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean for quite a long time um, from September to now. So I think it's only a matter of time before those territories have positive um, cases coming back as well. So is it to say, uh, Doc, that the possibility of we having that new strain in Trinidad, uh, what, what could be the percentage you would, you would put to that as we speak? Well, I, I mean, I answered this question a couple of weeks ago, and the, the answer, anything is possible. Um, we, we have a border that has a good, the, the way we have our quarantine set up is that everyone who comes through the legitimate borders are being quarantined, they're being tested. But of course, as we all know, there are people coming through outside of our legal borders, right? Um, so we have actually approached the Caribbean Public Health Agency to ask them to do some tests for the positives that come out of the migrant population as well, to see if that particular part of the world has been um, so infected. And of course, our risk will go according to what um, who comes to our country at this point. So we are hoping that, you know, our mitigation strategies at the port so far have been good enough. And because our borders have remained closed as opposed to our other CARICOM neighbors, that we we were able to keep this, this particular strain out so far. Um, but again, we are through the study with, with CAFA continuing to do sampling of one repatriated individuals who turn out to be positive, especially from UK and other territories that have confirmed the virus, as well as um, we have added to that just early today um, some, some sampling from the migrant population that have been positive as well. Uh, Dr. Price, from again, third question. Um, yeah. Presently, what is the figure, the amount of applications we have of individuals who would like to come back home? What's, what's that figure, average figure? Well, I think that figure um, is really held by national security. So Ministry of Health is not aware of that figure um, unless we are told by national security. So. What happens is once an exemption is granted, that person's name along with their details are sent to us with the flight details, and we arrange for their quarantine either at a state site or a state supervised site. That normally happens a couple of days before the person actually comes into country. We have that information at hand. So we only have the information of the exemptions granted. We don't have any, the Ministry of National Security will have full details of all the persons that would have applied for exemptions and they would have the entire list, and they would then, of course, send the, the ones that have been granted the exemptions to Ministry of Health to process for quarantine. Uh, okay, well, actually, why I asked that question, Doc, I wanted to, you know, make it in relation to our population figure, give and take 1.3 or 1.4 million persons, right. and to quote you, and I quote, if and when we reopen, right? And I know that statement is in relation to our borders. Yeah. Again, we know that we'll be hearing a lot of noise, a lot of negative comments with regards to the government of Trinidad and Tobago having the borders still closed. But I think if we listen to the international news, we are now seeing where a lot of those countries that open up, let's say in inverted commerce too early, yeah. are now reclosing their borders, right? We remain closed from then, March to now, and we continue to remain closed. And I would like to look at it in context of the amount of individuals that want to come home, the possibility of bringing not only the coronavirus, but the new strain of the coronavirus to our borders in light of, our, of the safety of our 1.3 or 1.4 million individuals. Again, 
As you said, we will be guided by the science. And also, this new strain is 50% more infectious. So again, borders being closed. And I know that the Ministry of, of National Security, along with your ministry, along with the Ministry of Health, are being guided to ensure that we bring in these persons on a scheduled basis. And I am totally in agreement with the possibility of the borders remaining closed, subject to the science that your department continue to supply to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So again, excellent job, right? We need to ensure that our population remains safe in lieu of the individuals that, yes, want to come home. We know it's a difficult time. We know it's a tough period. But again, we need to look at the, the bigger picture to ensure that Trinidad and Tobago remain safe. I don't know if you want to share any comment on that, Doc. Well, I, I, I agree with you, um, member, that we are, we are in a, a excellent position, and I think we are the envy of a lot of countries, the way we have handled this so far. But you see, if the borders are going to be reopened, we will now be facing not just the Ministry of Health um, having the lockdown and the protocols, but remember, the airports authority would have a part to play with immigration, customs, and a lot of other entities would be involved. And so it really depends on the fact that how do we have confidence in the airport authority to have that mandate if we are going to open the borders, you know, any time soon, that are we, are we comfortable with the position they are in, uh, in terms of how they are performing? Now, I realize that, yeah. Sure, yeah. So I, I realize that recently, um, I, I always love to hear good things about Trinidad and Tobago. And I realized recently the airports authority uh, were, they were actually praised and having, you know, by the ACI, the Airports Council International, where they were the first nation in the region to achieve accreditation at our two airports. So I felt good about that. But then seeing this recent um, uh, release from the Airports Authority, I question now, if, if we had, we got so much accolades in the region, and I'm proud, Trinidad and Tobago, that I am so proud of this. But then, when I look at this report that we have in submissions, I saw the uh, Ministry of Health um, submissions say there were, there were still gaps existing. And I also realized that even there were um, gaps in the ENR Robertson Airport in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of staffing. So, you know, I question, yes, the, the, the report is there, but the gaps are there. And it is major gaps, I'm thinking, that we have to, um, you know, work at, fill in. So my, my take on this is I heard um, Member DeFratis' uh, um, question. Um, who really will now um, step up the game with this new virus? And I really got the impression that the airports authority was saying it's really up to the Ministry of Health. Um, so therefore, um, you know, the, but there are other parameters within that airport that the health services may give recommendation, but it falls under immigrations and customs and different, different um, areas. And I would like to find out something, though. You see, if health is given the guidelines, Trinidad and Tobago, we, are, uh, we have been a signatory to the uh, Agency of United Nations, the CAO, where we had all, we, with this being a signatory, we had actually uh, said, stated that we would go along their guidelines to promote safe and orderly development of international civil aviation throughout the world. And, and this organization actually would, the ICAO would set the standards, um, the regulation, the standards necessary for aviation safety, security, efficiency, capacity, environmental protection. And so I'm trying to find out now who, and I think there are 193 member states, who would have the greater authority now. The Ministry of Health is here. They have guidelines. Uh, but if this um, ICAO guidelines are there and it runs 
different from our guidelines? I mean, would, would the ministry give in to their guidelines or should the ICAO be the body that oversees the whole operation of the airport? And I am even questioning the fact that, you know, even if the airport authority has things in place and, and, and there are certain guidelines called the CART guidelines and the CART guidelines, the, the Councillor Aviation Recovery Task Force, they have eight areas where they have checks and the eight areas are baggage claim area, disembarkment and arrival area, terminal, as a side area, terminal, gate equipment, security screening, terminal building, general checking area, exit, the land side area. So there are certain pillars there, eight areas that we must ensure that it is running efficiently. So, yeah. so, so I would like to ask the, the um, members of the airports authority, do you have, um, what do the AATT have a documented plan for the implementation of the specific guidance to address the eight elements of the airport module of the CART program. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I just want to, I will pass the, the, the response to one of my deputy general manager who was in actually actively involved with um, the accreditation, the health accreditation program, which, which is incidentally in accordance with the International Civil Aviation Organization CART recommendations. But um, before, I, before I pass it to him, I just want to indicate perhaps how the, the, the regime in which we, all, we, we operate. The International Civil Aviation Organization is the organization responsible for the harmonization of aviation internationally. But locally, the organization that is responsible in terms of ensuring that we follow the guidelines of, or the standards and recommended practices of IQ is rather the Trent Tobago Civil Aviation Organization. That's the regulator. And they regulate the, the, the environment, they regulate, they provide the regulations which are part of our national laws upon which the airport authority is in fact governed and the airport authority continue to operate. Um, the, the, the CART guidelines that, is, that was, had been indicated, CART meaning the Council Aviation Restart Task Force recommendations of the um, IKO was crucial. And, and in, in terms of us being accredited, it was crucial that by, by IKO to ensure that we are in compliance with the CART guidelines. What I'll do is I'll ask my Deputy General Manager to provide some further information in terms of how do the process and what went on in terms of this, the, the, this accreditation program. Mr. Sure, Pena. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Um, morning again, Chair. Actually, even before we go there, I'd like to point out the fact that the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority, given the new health requirements, would have set up a mechanism to provide oversight of the measures that are implemented by the Airport Authority of Trinidad and Tobago at PRO and ANR Robinson International Airport. Um, in, the, in terms of the ACI Airport Health Accreditation Program, we would have gone through a rigorous assessment process um, in accordance with the requirements of the IKO CART and the ACI recommendations. There would have been significant um, interaction between the AATT team at both airports and the team at ACI. Of course, we would have to verify the measures in place, and that was done through interviews, submission of documents, manuals, etc. We even had to go as far as presenting photographic evidence and images of our infrastructure. Um, ACI further goes on during the year, the year that the, the accreditation is valid for, to provide oversight of our processes through, again, interviews. Because as you're aware, they wouldn't be able to travel to our country at this point. So again, we need to reiterate that it was a vigorous process that we went through and it's ongoing. We are always under the oversight of ACI and by extension IQ. So sir, do you have any sort of audit plan such as the frequency of, of, of audits and areas of non-compliance and you know, closing actions? You see, what I'm seeing is that we set up things and I see, you know, sometimes we set up very good mechanism, very good um, systems. And then if there's no checks and balances, if there's no checks on it. So do you have a sort of auditing system that you go back now to see, hey, we are still on the right path? Uh, yeah. great, great question. 
actually, as part of the process, we had to prove that we had a quality control or quality assurance mechanism as part of it. So through our health, and health safety and environment department, the officers continually provide oversight and audit inspect the, the processes, both the passenger process throughout the entire journey, the, the map of the journey map, and the movement of persons throughout the terminal. Um, we have developed checklists in accordance with our manuals and the recommendations of the international organization. And, and that is continuous. So then, um, does the Civil Aviation Authority um, come on board to do that, checks also, to, to basically oversee that, your organization? Correct. So there, there will be a, an addition, another layer of, of oversight. So the oversight that I initially spoke of was our internal oversight to prove to ACI and IPO that we remain in accordance with their standards. I would, I would, I, I've got a question from members of the public, and so I want to be a little devil's advocate, all right? Um, first of all, the quarantine period, if you see somebody coming in and you have to quarantine for 14 days, um, whose responsibility is that? Is it the airport authority or is the Ministry of Health to ensure that individual goes under quarantine? It's either you can answer that or the minister of health. Because what I'm trying to get at is if there's a breach, who could we point fingers at? Is it your authority? Is it the Civil Aviation Authority? Is it the Ministry of Health? So, <clears throat> so it is the Ministry of Health. Um, I am the quarantine authority for Trinidad and I delegate authority to the CMOHs to do that function. So we will issue forms upon arrival, quarantine forms, whether it be for seven days, 14 days, state the place that you have to be quarantined. If there's a breach, we would inform the police and they would do the enforcement part of it. Um, so it is on, on the health under the quarantine act. Siebo, I, I would like to just elaborate a, a, a situation that I was um, made aware of. I, don't, I couldn't verify it and probably the airport's authorities uh, team could assess. Um, it was, someone had sent me a text where uh, with the situation where a private jet came in and certain members got out from that jet, they were tested temperature-wise, they were put in a bus and then helicopter, they were helicopter, they went to a rig. And that rig itself actually um, was in the news recently as being one of the rigs that the COVID went haywire. Now, is it that there was a breach in protocol in that instance? Is it that, uh, uh, you know, the, those nationals who came in from Houston, are they, uh, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, the, 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 it, the query was, are some, is it certain people could get away with this thing? Or is it, was it a lapse? Or did the policy develop after that instance? So, so in terms of the oil and gas sector, throughout the epidemic, there was a different form of quarantine. A lot of them were coming from outside. So they did their quarantine in their country of origin. They did a PCR usually before they went, going to, before they start their quarantine at day one or day two of their quarantine in that country. They would then do a PCR in recent times, 72 hours prior to coming to Trinidad. So their 14-day quarantine would have been done in the country of origin. They would have flown directly here and then, of course, straight from here onto the ring, making sure that they were negative. So that is for people coming from outside. For people coming from inside Trinidad, our locals going onto a rig, the procedure is they should have, of course, a PCR before going onto the ring, and they should have some period of quarantine. I, in, the, in the phase when we, were, we had little or no transmission, they were doing seven days. Prior to that, they were doing 14 days. In some cases, at one of the... Um, hotels throughout the island. So they were paying for the oil companies, were paying for um, persons to stay there, they do their PCR and then they go out to the rig. So there was protection of the rig in, in that regard because the rig, of course, as we saw with the incident with Perenco, is a high risk environment similar to cruise ships. So we have to treat it as an entity unto itself and we were ensuring persons going onto the rig. And of course, persons exiting from the rig and coming back onto land didn't have any risk of transmitting the virus back to the community when they went home. So there was checks and balances on both sides of the, um, of the equation for oil and gas, slightly different from what was happening otherwise, but these remain remembering that these persons would have come straight from their territory, done their quarantine, not spend any time on land in Trinidad, 
and go straight to the rigs having had the negative smears. So if, if a citizen try to institute the same guidelines saying they get a negative test abroad, they quarantine for 14 days, and you could show that they quarantine for 14 days by some checks over there, and they want to come to their homes. You see, if somebody come in now and say that, they may figure that they are getting some inequality of treatment. Now, I understand the rigs and the oil industry has to run. But in terms of, of, of the question that was posed from this person, um, you know, we may you, again, and even with the new strain of the COVID, we may have to get some other stringent method to, you know, to prevent something like that happening in the future. So, yeah, so I think it's a matter of cost. As you know, the state bears the cost of the quarantine in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so when someone comes in, we, and we are the ones um, through the CMOHs that will actually monitor patients by having healthcare workers on those sites. So we are assured that those persons are being monitored. And of course, the necessary swabbing is done if you pick up signs and symptoms. There's no assurance otherwise um, for, for a national coming back into Trinidad beyond, you know, um, if, if quarantine is being done in those sites. And then again, the, the price has to be borne by the individual. So we had had arrangements through the oil and gas industry where they would have paid for their employees. So that, that was a separate, uh, as I said, separate um, sort of stream. And it was ensured at all stages that those persons, even as they came off the aircraft, they weren't allowed to mix and mingle in the country. So the, the key to it is, of course, maintaining the quarantine. And there will be changes to the quarantine length, um, the time for quarantine, where you can quarantine as it evolves. Um, for now, I think based on the new strain, we, we need to be as stringent as we possibly can to prevent it coming into Trinidad and Tobago. So that is where, where we are gauging, taking our gauge for the quarantine time and period and where it should be spent at this point. But of course, as the days and months progress, we can look at alternatives, alternate um, mechanisms, whether it be at home. We have already explored with national security the possibility of doing voluntary wearing of bracelets, which are used in another territory. I believe Cayman Islands already using bracelets to ensure that when you send someone into home quarantine, that they actually, if they breach the quarantine, a message goes to their police force and they can ensure that you stay at home. So our biggest concern with sending people home at this point is people abiding by the stay at home order. If we can get the bracelets in, in stream, we can assure that they stay at, the, at one residence and that the quarantine will be better held at home. Then we can possibly look at that decision further. But with a new strain, I think the best bet to contain will be to have them in a state or state supervised facility. Uh, one question again, Mr. CMO. If, being devil's advocate, if a uh, vice president comes in in a private jet and is shipped away to a different destination, do you have the authority to stop that? So anyone that comes into Trinidad and Tobago will have to do two things. They will have to be granted an exemption from the Minister of National Security, and in which case the exemption is granted um, they would, Ministry of National Security will normally engage health to find out the conditions of the exemption and the conditions under which the exemption should be granted. For example, um, if that particular case you said, we will say that this person has to undergo 14 days quarantine, they will place a notice on the exemption that says you have to undergo state quarantine or state supervised quarantine for 14 days, and that will be done. There's no, there's no circumstance where someone coming in and staying in Trinidad will not have a quarantine as you from a high risk or medium risk country. Low risk countries, people are allowed to quarantine, but they're allowed to do so at home. Other than that, they have to, or anyone that enters the, the territory will have to do quarantine um, in a state or state supervised um, facility. And that goes on the exemption when the Ministry of National Security grants it. So they, so they know what is happening before they come. Well, I thank you very much for that response because I'm saying now it's different times, now it's a more serious strain, so we have to now do things in a manner that is, you know, you know a greater degree of care. I I'm now would like to recognize um, Mrs. Lisa Morris-Julian, who has a question. Sure, Chairman, and thank you. I well, this question will be to the airport authority and perhaps Dr. Parser to some extent. I um I want to find out about technology and 
our use of technology with regards to the screening. And in particular, I am thinking about our counterparts in Barbados, Dr. Parasaram, where they had a bracelet system, not the electronic bracelet, but basically they tagged the tourists. And, and what was stated is that the tourists simply cut off the bracelet and went and interacted, hence the spread. And I'm wondering, what do we have in place? And in particular, when I'm talking about types of technology with our COVID-19 strategy, is it evolving? Is it the same that we're using, for example, in schools, which is sanitization and temperature checks? And also, I would like to know um, with contact tracing, I know we spoke about it a little, but is there a team assigned for contact tracing in the airport? Is there one particular person verifying, checking, or is this simply when you come, depends on what you say on your phone? Thank you very much, Chairman. Okay, so let me let me first answer the question with Barbados. I believe Barbados was using an app, if I recall, um, on their phone where they can report daily symptoms and they could have done a GPS mapping to your phone. Um, so they were using, but the, the technology we are exploring with regards to the bracelet, if you do cut the bracelet, um, a message will be sent to the police force and they will be, again, in breach of the quarantine. They, so, so even if you cut it or remove it in any form or fashion, an alert will go to the police force and as well as health. So we will know that that has been done. So that's the technology we want to use in, in, in terms of quarantine. What we are using currently for contact tracing is telemedicine. We have brought on stream a number of um, physicians and nurses, and they have been placed at every county medical officer of health in Trinidad to increase the number of staff that we have to actually physically call persons. They've been given telephones as well. So we will get a full list of any positives or suspected cases, primary contacts, secondary contacts, whether it be from the airport or outside, and they will be um, assigned to actually individuals and they will call them twice a day to ensure that they do um, checks on them, see where their location is at. And of course, we have referred a number of those cases to the police for breach of quarantine. And those persons have been brought into the step down and they're in the process of being prosecuted under the Quarantine Act. Um, so the process we're using now is more telemedicine based. We're looking at the app, for the, the app as well to replace some of the telemedicine work where people will be able to actively send data on their well-being back to the ministry, as well as, of course, the, tele the, the bracelets, which will be more for security purposes. So once we have that in place, we can have, be a, a little more comfortable that those who are in quarantine stay in, quor in quarantine and can be monitored all, all through the day and night. I, I thank you for that question, um, um, member. And I... I the Barbados system had me, you know, in awe in the sense that initially we heard that they had a contactless immigration system, the online uh, immigration arrival cards, and also computerized, um, you know, areas that, you know, people wouldn't have to have that contact with the immigration officers. Uh, the, um, so, you know, initially it sounded good, but then look what happened to... Uh, Barbados now. They have now in a uh, situation, and I think probably um, they could have learned from us in terms of our lockdown guidelines. But I would like to ask the members of the Airports Authority, um, in terms of the running of the terminals itself, are there any food courts or food um, areas still existing? And are there any um, sort of improvements given to those areas? Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, my um, Deputy General Manager in charge of operations, Piapo will take the question. Yes, Chairman, uh, at Piapo International, we have limited food and beverage available. Um, for example, the, the takeaways and the mechanisms we have put in place is the, the concessioners had to prove to us that they have the measures in place. For example, the alterations to the infrastructure through the establishment of sneeze guards and the social distancing markers on the floor. And uh, there's no eating in, of course. People buy and take away. 
Um, yes, yeah, so I, okay, so that's, that's comforting to know that that has um, been implemented. And in terms of the, I noticed in your submission, you said the ATT, you know, informed that you needed um, to purchase electrostatic, you had purchased electrostatic fogging machines were required to assist with the sanitization of both airports. Um, could you tell me when were these machines acquired and the cost of acquiring the machines? Chairman, um, the, the machines were acquired in, in the last quarter of, of, of 2020. I think it's October, November, somewhere there, the, the machines were actually um, procured. The, the exact figure, I, I don't have it here. Um, we could provide it to the committee. I don't have the, the figure in terms of it, but we, we, the machines are available both at, at Piaco and, and ANR in terms of usage. So you have two machines available presently? Yes. 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 Yes, thank you. Because I noticed that, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm glad that Tobago was included in that because I've noticed that in the submissions that, you know. Chairman, yeah, sure. Chairman one thing, we actually have more than two machines. We have four machines, um, four in, um, six machines, um, four in, in, at Piaco and two at and in our Robinson. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> So those, those machines, who are in charge of those machines? Is it the Ministry of Health will do their um, electrostatic fogging, or is it uh, airports authority staff? It's airports authority staff. We have personnel have been trained um, by the provider to use these machines, and it's, it's, it's airports authorities, uh, custodial maintenance staff that, that, that is involved in terms of utilizing those machines. And was the Ministry of Health involved in the um, the this procedure to, to acquire those machines because I am um, seeing that the Ministry of Health um, also have their, uh, their, their health officers, their, the port health officers who do spraying. So I'm looking at, you know, you have the Ministry of Health having those persons on board and now you have um, this uh, electrostatic fogging machines being bought. Is it a duplication or did you, um, yeah, so could you clarify the role of um, the Ministry of Health involvement in your um, purchase? Okay, well, so, um, I'm, I'm not aware that the Ministry of Health is involved in any kind of spraying in the airport. It's, it's, it's the airport authority staff that's responsible for the issue of maintenance and that kind of thing. So this, the, the, the use of the machines is clearly the airport authority staff. Um, we, were, we were guided by um, the, the, the protocols um, from Ministry of Health and also international best practices in terms of you purchasing those particular machines to be used. Um, what, why it, 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 it breaks down, it, it, it prevents the need for having to use things such as going and wipe down surfaces and stuff like that. It's much easier to be used and it's much safer and the sanitizing is done in a much, a much more efficient manner, utilizing the, 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 the electrostatic the fogging machines. Well, yes, I, I, I agree that the, you're keeping up with the times and it's, it's actually a good investment, but um, I'm just trying to, you know, get the rules, you know, if there are duplications of rules. Because I know the public health uh, officers, the, the, um, the port health officers, they actually spray the aircrafts. And they are in charge of, of giving clearance to the aircraft, the uh, pratique of the aircraft to say it's fit to go on its way. So, so yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, so the... Port health officers check for what is called a, a aircraft disinsection certificate. So the the authority, whether it is Caribbean Airlines, the, the whoever is the airport, the the owner of the, the fleet, mm -hmm. for example, Caribbean Airlines or JetBlue, whoever it may be, they are the ones that will have to do the spraying. Normally, what happens is, is the health control officers or the health control technicians, aside from the airport, will also look when the spraying is being done, and they are supposed to sign off that the spraying is done appropriately. And that is for residual spraying of the aircraft for with regards to vector control. So that happens not for sanitization, but that happens for vector control activities. Um, also, we, we do have a perifocal operator in the portal unit at the airport, and that person's sole function is really to go around the different sites of the airport to ensure 
that there are no vectors or no potential breeding sites for vectors of, for example, mosquitoes in the environs of the airport and even within a certain radius around the, the airport. And that is, again, in alignment with what is recommended by the WHO in, in terms of IHR, that the airports are supposed to be vector-free zones. So that is the portal function. Um, we don't conduct any spraying at the portal unit that is left for the airports, but we have oversight over the way it is done. And that is for vector control, not for sanitization. So the vector control would look at, I think, sorry, their functions in the past would look for like rodent, roaches, mosquitoes coming in, in terms no. of, of overseeing from certain comp, um, endemic countries if yes. certain things are coming in. But I had a concern from a worker who said that if, you know, when they put that residual spray in, and I think they may do it every three to four months with residual spray in rather than, you know, they, and if they are doing that residual spray in, um, would the decontamination of the aircraft after um, somehow lessen the, the residual spray that is there? And, you know, instead of having a three to four month residual spray, we may now have to look at the fact that we have to probably bring it into a shorter period. Is that anything you're looking into? But, so the residual spraying is usually done on a certain area of the aircraft. Um, usually the first two to three feet on the lower part of the aircraft where they, their feet are more against the sideboards. Those are not the areas that you will tend to sanitize. You will tend to sanitize the, the back of the seats as well as the areas where you have persons, um, the, the food trays, those kinds of things where the, the high touch surfaces. So there shouldn't be an overlap between where the, the residual spray is applied versus where the sanitization is occurring. Um, so it's two different areas and I don't think it should have any cha significant change in the way that the residual spraying is applied. It is, it is um, approved by World Health Organization pesticide evaluation scheme for, for certain areas of use. And it is also approved for use within a certain time frame because you can't do it more often than, than is stipulated for um, as it may cause untoward effects. So we don't want to do it too often as well. Um, okay. Just a word of caution, of course, with the sanitization to be mindful that we don't sanitize the areas that are residually sprayed. Uh, Dr. Parasam, could you tell me about the amount of healthcare workers that are currently stationed at the airports on a daily basis? Yeah, I, um, that staff falls, it's, it's roughly about 24 people, but that staff falls under Dr. Fraser, so he could give the exact number. Um, but before he goes, what, what we are trying to do and what the pandemic has allowed us to do, for many, many years, we tried to create a new position of Port Health Officer. Um, and we're happy to, to, to say that we actually were able to create that new position. We created a job description and we actually went out to advertisement for 50 individuals, not only for the airport, but also for the seaport, to create this cadre of um, staff which is suitable and specific to port health activities. Out of the 50 persons that we advertised for, we got 18 persons um, coming in, and they would come in between, I, I believe a few of them may have started already, between January and March of 2021, and they'll replace the older health control officer staff who will now go back to vector control and backfill some vacant positions there. Um, so we have that in place. Dr. Fraser, if you want to give an account of what type of staff you have currently and the numbers to the chairman. Sure, thank you, CMO. Um, cu currently, we do have um, a complement of 21 health control slash health control officers, health control technicians, um, in addition to two perifocal officers and a public health inspector too, who is the supervisor for, for all of the staff I just mentioned. Um, the staff works uh, shift, so there are three shifts a day, um, starting at six in the morning, um, six to two, two to 10, and then 10 to six overnight. And generally you tend to have um, on staff about four to five persons on staff in every, in every shift of those, of those officers. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. But I have a question again. The, um, if, uh, oh. Sorry. Hi, may I? 
You can go ahead. I wanted to ask a question based on Dr. Fraser's response. Sure. Um, you mentioned that you have 21 health control officers, technicians, and I wanted to find out how many of those officers, if any, are assigned to our um, airport in Tobago, please. No, I, that's, ju that's just for Piaco. Sure, yeah. So, so in terms of Tobago, I'm trying to get Dr. Hoyt. I believe there was a power outage where she was stationed so she said she's not back on as yet but um feeling that she does come on there are officers assigned to to Piaco, health control officers up to um tobago as well um so they are health control officers similar sort of cadre of staff um they perform that function throughout the the hours of the airport as well um, and they are stationed at the seaport at scarborough so she can when she comes back on or even afterwards we can provide you with the number of persons and okay. the various categories that, that they occupy, but they are different and they, they're unique to Tobago. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to um, draw the attention to the CMO that the Airports Authority in its written submission indicated that personnel needed to conduct health screening at the points of entry into the terminal is also not currently available at the uh, ENR Robertson Airport in Tobago. Now, with the traffic of the, the tourists and whatnot in Tobago, has the Ministry of Health attempted to collaborate with the relevant division of the THA to address this matter? So, yes, again, um, I know that from what Dr. Hoyt has indicated to me, she has been in very close communication with the deputy uh, director, I believe, of Airports Authority in Tobago, who I believe is on. Um, and I don't know if she wants to shed some light before Dr. Hoyt comes back on. Yeah, sure. Okay, that'll be fine. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Committee. I, I am not able to confirm the total number of officers. Dr. Hoyt will have to confirm that. But what I can say is I'm aware that um, a recruitment process would have started in Tobago to um, recruit additional officers. Um, I am aware that the the Division of Health is actually pursuing that at this time. In terms of timelines, I am not certain. Um, but the initial response we would have indicated in our submission had to do with the design of the airport and additional officers being needed to monitor and perform health screening. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I would like to um, also... Huh? Yeah, so Dr. Hoyt, I think you wanted to respond. Yeah. She she hasn't returned um, as yet, so I'm trying to get the answers from her um, offline. So um, in the interim, um, Chairman, can I come in? Sure, uh, Member Ford, you can proceed. Yes, um, my, my question is directed to the Airports Authority team. The processing of persons that um, that come in on those flights. Um, could you just give us briefly a little synopsis on, on, on how the processing takes place um, in terms of the flight arriving, the persons coming off the, the airplane, and you know where are they taking? You know, I know that there's the, the buses on the tarmac. You know, how, how, how is the process? Just give us a little quick synopsis how the process takes place. My, was my question here, Chairman? Oh, yes, we, we heard, I heard it on my part, yeah. Uh, Airport Authority? Airport Authority, did you hear? The processing of, of individuals that, that return on, on the repatriated flights. Let's give us a little synopsis on, on how the process takes place, the processing takes place. Yeah, remember, um, this is Hayden Newton, General Manager. What I will do is I'll put it to the Operations Manager, Piaco. Right, because he has been actively, his team has actively been involved, the Deputy General Manager Operations Piaco, their team have been actively involved in terms of, of, of that process. One of the things I want to say before I hand to him, however, is from December the 1st, um, 2020, we actually um, commence the repatriation um, passengers actually coming through the terminal. Prior to that, it was a situation where the repatriation passengers were actually going, um, being dealt with on the tarmac. 
But with the advice and concurrence of all the stakeholders, it was determined on December, by December the 1st that passengers are now being facilitated through the, the terminal itself. So, um, could, um, uh, Mr. Minal, you could perhaps give some more details? Yes. So, the situation that obtains Make now. Sure Make sure they hear me. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, here. I'm, here. I'm listening. Yes. Okay, nice. Yeah. So, the situation that currently obtains is that the uh, there's a, it's a collaborative approach between among the airports authority, the Ministry of National Security, Ministry of Health, and the other government entities, immigration, customs. Um, the aircraft lands, the passengers, of course, come in with the requirement of having a negative, having taken a negative PCR test. They come off the aircraft and they are processed through the, the terminal. That decision was taken with the concurrence of the Ministry of Health and all the players, all the measures being in place and protocols being followed. The then truck goes through immigration, customs, and then out onto a waiting bus. And then they are taken to those who go into government quarantine are transported via the Ministry of National Security. In terms of sanitization, the areas are immediately sanitized after the full flight has cleared the, the area. So we will do all of the touch points along the passenger journey. In terms of the, the luggage area, how, how are there? Well, I, we, we wouldn't have experiences of traveling normally. You know, that rush that takes place to get your luggage and so on. How is the situation of the luggage area carried out? For the luggage area, yes. Um, well, in customs, again, we have the floor markers in place to ensure the, the social distancing. We also have people on the ground to ensure that you have adherence to the, to the protocols. So in the case of the repatriation flights, you would not find a rush at all. Um, tell, tell me something, um, again, just so my edification and have to be sure, it's only CAL flights, repatriated flights, that are coming in. Correct. Commercial. Commercially, yeah. Commercially, okay, great. Um, and it's usually, it's usually one on any particular day. Uh, member, let me just add something to that. Uh, Carl is the major in terms of the repatriation flights, but we do have some uh, charters coming in with passengers too. All right, and and the, the numbers are not as, as as big in terms of the repatriation flights for Carl, so it's um, there's no there's no major gathering take, that takes place as they come in. Um, with the, with the charter, similarly, it's not large numbers. So um, this the situation is, is 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 fairly easily handled. Uh, Kurt, you can. And again, and again, Mr. Chairman, um, again, um, CEO of, of yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Um, and again, these flights. So on a weekly basis, we we are not talking that you all are out on the job every day at the airport. Well, that, that is not that is not true. Uh, the the airport's operation staff is out every day. Uh, as as normal because the the charters the the repatriation flight the um, the cargo flights are, are, are very active, right? Uh, so it's it's the the, the the closure of the border has affected the question of the normal commercial flights in terms of passenger movement, but really cargo flights. Uh, when we look at the, the it has been done by perhaps about 20, 30 percent, but still that is significant. All right, the normal cargo movement is taking place as in, in terms of the in terms of the airport at Piaco. At ANR, it's different. At ANR, it's, it's largely the domestic the domestic movements. But at Piaco, it's the the active area, the ramp area is is, is fairly active. Right. And and as the CEO of Airports Authority, you are satisfied based on the COVID nineteen protocols and regulations that have been set up by the CEO, CMO and his team that you are satisfied that all the regulations are put in place, give and take, satisfactory, good? How would you, how would you rate the performance of, of, of your team in ensuring that you all adhere to the protocols as set out by the CMO for the guidelines at the airport? The airport environment is, as I said, fundamentally an environment of risk management. So we have been engaged in risk management as a part of our normal business. The requirements that has been put in place as a, as a consequence of the COVID-19 by the Ministry of Health, we have ensured 
that we have rigorously adhered as much as possible to what is to, 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 to do those requirements because we understand the challenge if in fact there's any breaches. All right. So we have, we feel pretty confident, and we have we want to say again that working with the team from um, Dr. Fraser, the CMOH, and the team in Tobago has been a, a, a significant experience in terms of collaboration, and we feel that we will be ready to deal with any of the challenges associated with this pandemic. Last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, I cannot recall exactly when this situation occurred, but I think it was pretty early when our borders were, were closed, where there was a slight security hiccup with a passenger trying to run away, you know, run away or escape or, you know, however you'd like to term it. Uh, could you just shed a little light in terms of the possibility of things like that happening? Uh, you know, it's, it's minimal now because, uh, and it's, it's a situation that did happen, according to you, Mr. Chairman, where individuals try to, to run away. I can't recall an individual trying to run, run away at all. I mean, I'm, I'm my deputy general manager in charge of security is watching me, and what is what is this about? No, I can't recall it. But, but my my um, member, um, the security level is is of the highest. The, the, we we continue to make sure that that mandate in terms of safe, but also secure aviation services is kept to, the, to its fullest. Okay, fair enough. I, I will I will be satisfied with that answer. Chairman, uh, may I ask a question, please? Uh, I think Member Defeaters had his hand up first. If after Member Defeaters, then you can go, please. Uh, she may go ahead. She may go ahead. I'll come in after her. That's okay. Okay, right. sure. Ladies no, I, first, so you can go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I still don't know how to do the hand raising um, electronically. I'll figure it out, though. Um, uh, coming back to the... the um, what the... Um, Airport Authority mentioned about cargo. I just wanted to find out something. Um, sanitization of the cargo areas, because of course we've heard about the fact that coronavirus can live on surfaces up to for an extended period of time and all of that. Are the electrostatic fogging machines used um, in the cargo um, handling areas as well? I'm not talking about the baggage, I just for commercial, um, for um, normal persons, but the area where you have the, the cargo coming in um, because, of course, we have food and medical supplies and all those things coming through. What's the sanitization? Is it the same as it is for the regular parts of the airport where people are moving through? Or do you have special procedures in place with cargo handling? The electrostatic foggers are used in the commercial terminal in terms of the passenger terminal. In terms of the cargo, cargo areas, the cargo handlers have their own processes to make sure that, in fact, that the whatever is bringing is safe. But we have, we, have, we have oversight of the processes, and we know that the processes are, are rigorous to ensure that the, any, any question of the, that the pathogen coming in there is actually dealt with. But okay. the, the electrostatic um, um, fog is not used in that area. Okay. You can shed some light on what, or do you have that information, what the processes are like for cargo areas? I don't have the information offhand, but I could provide it to the, to the committee. I'll have it and I'll provide it to the committee, members of the committee. Sure. Thank you. Um, my second question would be with respect to, uh, I, I logged off for a while, so forgive me if somebody already, um, I had switched devices, but forgive me if somebody already mentioned this, but um, you talked about the port health isolation rooms when someone is an actual suspected case. Um, that's part of your submission. Do you have the data with respect to how many actual suspected cases were picked up since the border has been closed and, and persons would have been placed into the um, port isolation room and then subsequently have to go through a more rigorous process before being released from the, well, released from the airport, so to speak? Well, the airport authority doesn't have that information. I don't know if the Ministry of Health could, in fact, indicate. I, I, I don't have that information. Because the port, the port health isolation room is under the control of the Ministry of Health. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if anybody from health, if um, the, the chief um, okay. so, or the county. So I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Fraser answer. But first, um, I got the information that we all have requested from Dr. Hoyt. Um, she said 14 health control officers under the service commission are presently on the ground and 14 will be hired on contract hotel control officers. So just to clarify before Dr. Fraser comes in, um, what we do with the, with the observation room is, of course, if anyone is flagged to us 
as of having concern whether we pick up somebody that has fever, one, or if someone that is declared on the health declaration as having any illness, they are taken straight into the portal room. Um, we can determine, uh, Dr. Fraser, if you want to come in and say whether you have any instances where we would have had a suspect COVID or, or a febrile case over the last few months, if you have any data. So, um, fortunately for us, we've not had any clinically suspect case um, coming in to use that room. So people have been flying, and those of you who have been screening the health declaration. Sorry, apologies. Um, yes, we, we haven't had, fortunately, we haven't had anyone who has um, not passed the screening process. So we haven't had anyone who's come with a fever or with symptoms and signs of suspected COVID-19. Um, what we have had to use the room for uh, in the earlier part of the pandemic response, when we were stopping persons coming from uh, specific countries, we've had to use that room to conduct interviews for those persons and then to process um, them being repatriated back to where they had come from. But we have fortunately not had anyone who was ill and needing to use those rooms as of, as of yet. Oh, if I can just add, um, Chair, if it's okay. Um, the majority of cases of any infectious disease that you will pick up, especially for COVID-19, as Dr. Fraser indicated before, now having in place a 72-hour PCR, and of course, airports across the world putting in place what we call exit screening, meaning that you really shouldn't board an aircraft if you have any signs and symptoms of an illness. So there's heightened public health alert from all countries across the world to not allow persons who are ill to come in, come onto a plane. Chances are, I mean, aside from other things that may occur, for example, a um, myocardial infarction en route or some sort of gastrointestinal illness that just, or, or other illness, dizziness or fainting or something that may occur, Hardly likely you're going to pick up those things occurring in an airport at this time. Um, you will more pick it up beyond that, and that's why our quarantine process is very important for picking up those individuals. And we have picked up, as you know, people who have come in with their 72-hour PCR negative on day six. On day 12, when we had a 14 day, we would have picked up positives. We would have picked up people with symptoms after they went through the airport and they went into the quarantine sites, right? So the conversion is usually not in the port of entry, usually happens afterwards. So the airport has a role, but it's not very great in terms of picking up disease, especially as you have the 72 hours of PCR as a filter and you have exit screening occurring across the world. Okay, thank you, Chair. That's all for um, my questions. Thank you. So Mr. Chair, can I ask my question now? Sure. Mr. De Yes, uh, I just wanted to um, to ask the question because we've heard of so many great protocols and and safety measures being put in place for the entire morning since we've been having this inquiry. Um, but we have also heard of other countries close to us and, and not so close um, having to respond in, in a certain way in spite of their best efforts. So my question is really to, to Dr. Parasaram that if in spite of our best efforts, this new variant, variant sorry, makes it into the population, do you, do you see Trinidad and Tobago having to go back into a lockdown to treat with that, given its 50% increase in infection rate? Well, I mean, we, we will have to deal with it as, as we have dealt with COVID-19 on the whole. Um, of course, looking at our cases, what we do is we test, we contact trace, we quarantine all suspected cases of any disease, whether it be COVID-19 or anything else. Um, if it is the new strain, we won't be able to discern whether it is the new strain or not unless we send it for genetic testing. What it will do, it will come back as COVID-19 positive on our PCR test, which is what we will pick it up as. Um, and of course, we will treat that in the same vein as we do treat everything else. If we're getting to, to later on, maybe in the months to come, if we get to a position where other countries in Europe are, in the sense that the majority of the cases that they now have are of the new strain, where you have a change in the in the actual incidence of the strain, 
then of course, only time will tell whether we need to go further in terms of restrictions. But for now, we hope that we can contain it out of Trinidad. And even if we get, for God forbid, a few cases coming through, that we're able to pick them up as COVID-19 early, contact trace the contacts and ring fence them in a way that it doesn't get out into the general population. Um, so that's, that's the strategy. Um, again, COVID-19 has proven to the world that there's nothing that is for sure. It will change. Um, something that you know today, of course, can be completely different and, and can be, uh, the research will change from one hour to the next. Um, so nothing that I say can be for certain in, in terms of how our response will be. But we have to treat it as, as we have to go for the known to the unknown, treat it as we know COVID-19 to be now. Of course, um, as the data comes to us, we will, we will amend our strategies to suit. But so far, what we can do is test, contact trace, and ring fence all the cases that we get. And that's the best we can do for now. Well, thank you, uh, CMO. I want to know if any members have any further questions, because we are planning to uh, end this meeting at 12.30. But, uh, so, but I have one question to the Airports Authority before. So members, please think ahead. The Airports Authority had indicated in yeah, the I think, I think Member Webster Roy had a question. <laughs> she had a hand up. OK, um, you, could, you could go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question came in from a, a member of the public in Tobago, and it's actually a follow-up to a question asked by Member Ford about handling of repatriation flights. Um, the question that came to me was, why aren't repatriation flights allowed to land in Tobago first? Tobagonians allowed to disembark and do the necessary quarantine on the island. That's a question that the airport's authority could, in fact, answer. We, we, we are not a part of the decision in terms of the, the, the repatriation flight. It's really the Ministry of National Security that deals with the issue in terms of repatriation flights. Yeah. Could CMO give us any insight in that? Do you have anything to add, CMO? No, um, I mean, in terms of the, I think it is a matter of, it has to do with capacity one. Um, and, and as far as I am aware from the discussions, we were dealing with Trinidad, um, the airport in Trinidad being the major um, airport for travel in the first instance. But again, as, as Mr. Newton said, the final determination as to which flight is allowed in is really for national security to determine. Um, but again, when we had started seeing cases of COVID, because of the capacity in Tobago to treat COVID is, is a little less than in Trinidad, um, of course, if you're picking up cases, if you have to quarantine large groups of people, it, they will be better placed in Trinidad to do so. Um, so those sorts of, um, that's the sort of thinking that would have went to, into the decisions to use Trinidad as the primary hub for repatriation in the first instance. I, I, Mr. Cloud, could you um, yes, ask Chair. a question? Um, so, Again, well, all morning, we have heard of all these strategies that have been implemented, which is, of course, commendable. But no doubt there's a cost attached to each and every one of these strategies that has uh, just been embarked upon, right? Um, my question is really relative. It, it is directed to the airport's authority as it relates to cost and the management of cost uh, um, of all these strategies that has since been implemented uh, since the advent of COVID or the, since uh, the realization of COVID in our jurisdiction. Now, in the, the airport's authority submission at page 13, um, which of course the public would have to appreciate and commend the airport authorities for, it was stated that the airport authority plans to control, and I will quote because this actually was taken from their submissions, that they plan to control expenses by undertaking missions critical, um, undertaking missions critical maintenance projects only. Um, if the airport authority could perhaps shed some light uh, on the the projects that they deem as critical for 2021 as it relates to Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago separately. Okay, thank you, member. Um, 
Oh, the mandate of this organization is to provide safe and secure aviation services. So that guided us in terms of the question of which projects we would, in fact, ensure we, um, given, given the limitation of our resources, because uh, as we are aware, the borders have been closed for, for 10 months, and the major <coughs> sources of revenue for the airport's authority has been um, monies associated with passenger movement, flight landing. We don't have that in terms of the aeronautical revenue, as, as it's called. Um, so we have had to ensure that we have financially, we act financially prudent in terms of how we do things. Um, the, our capital expenditure, as uh, we would have um, submitted to the Ministry of Works and Transport in terms of projects that we, we determined are, are critical projects, projects that affects the issue of this issue of this this um, important issue of safety and security. I don't have the details in front of me, but I want to, in fact, I want to, in fact, um, commit to, to provide to the committee the details of the projects that we will want to do into the into, in the next fiscal year. All right. Certainly, all of the projects are related to that question of safety, security. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to just follow up that with that question. I noted that the Airport Authority had a total projected expenditure of around four million dollars, four, four million sixty-one thousand and eight hundred and seventy dollars. Yes. Have you, for various um, measures you wanted to implement, like signs and signage, yes. etc., yes. have you been uh, receiving any sort of um, subventions from the? releases from the uh, ministry, your relevant ministry, Ministry of Works? Okay. Um, we have the Airports Authority, just to give a uh, Chairman, are you hearing me? Uh, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, the Airports Authority um, has, has not been in receipt of recurrent expenditure from the, uh, from the central government. In fact, we have we haven't had to request um, um, uh, recurrent expenditure in, within the last perhaps 15, 15 years, given the fact that we were um, um, operating based upon internally generated funds because we the commercial viability of the our our aeronautical and non aeronautical business. But given the challenge in the last the last nine, ten months, we have made requests to the Ministry of Works and Transport for recurrent expenditure to assist us in terms of managing managing our finances going forward. And we are advised by the ministry that they, in fact, working strenuously in terms of providing that kind of that funding to us. Um, so, yeah. so far you have received no funding from the ministry? For recurrent expenditure? No. If you do receive that funding, how soon could you, would you be saying, you know, I am ready to open, you know, you're advising government, they can open the borders because you have everything in place. You'll be able to buy your, your thermal scanners and fix the Tobago terminal as you wanted. How could you give me an idea that how you get that bill and how soon as a timeline you would be able to say you might be ready to give a suggestion? A, 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 a chairman, the thermal scanners, let's just to clear up, is, is really the Ministry of, of Health. But in terms of our readiness to open, whether or not we receive the funds from government, the airports authority will be ready to open for business when the powers will be declared that the borders are open. All right? We, uh, we I made the point about exercising uh, financial prudence, and, uh, and we even in the context, and I'm not saying it's 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 a a, a a a situation financially where we are where we would like to be, but even in the context of that, we will be ready um, to ensure that we will be open for business when the government declares. They say that I um, mm -hmm. I commend you for that positive attitude. I am I really like what I'm hearing from you. But I am also would like the um, permanent secretary, the acting uh, permanent secretary, to please note your requests and please note with this, um, you know, strain that we are getting in this COVID that, you know, I think she may have to try to expedite this to, you know, ensure, you know, that you, I know you said you're capable and um, you have a good track record. And I know that, um, 
you and your team would be there working towards it, but we outside cannot afford for any little strains to get out there. And we are pleading with you to the Ministry of um, the Ministry of Works to yeah, and I'm, I'm asking the PS as she's there, and you know, she was very quiet and she probably thought we forgot her. Please give us a little response, <laughs> Ms. Um, Ram, Ramdad. Chair, uh, I, I didn't think that you forgot me. Um, um, I know the, my gentlemen and ladies, you all are experts in the areas that you have been pushed um, to respond to your questions. So um, I am grateful for their expertise. So, Chair, I want to share with you, yes, I recognize uh, that uh, the, there are challenges in terms of our financial um, sector, as well as we have a lot of financial constraints in the, every sector at this time. And we are working closely with the Ministry of Finance to assist us in actually prioritizing and acquiring the necessary finance that we need. Ministry of Finance has been assisting us and uh, uh, we continue to work closely with them. We are in a situation where we have to prioritize what is uh, the most urgent and uh, source that funds. And at this time, we are seeking the cabinet's approval to get additional funding for airports authority. Thank you. Um, PS there, acting PS. I, I am sure, as, as you've heard, the concerns of the medical personnel, the concerns of the airport authority, the, the fact that we have this strain, I'm sure you would now be going with a little more energy to try and see if you can get those funds to help our country, right? So thank you. So now I would like to, so if no members have any further questions, I would like now to uh, adjourn this meeting. And and I would like, before I adjourn the meeting, I would like to ask members of who participated from the various departments to give a few closing remarks. And I would like to start with Mr. Hayden Newton. Chairman, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to have um, presented our, our position before the committee. Uh, one of the things, I mean, that we want to indicate is that the challenges that we have faced um, has allowed uh, the airport's authority to, in fact, re-examine its whole approach in terms of dealing with things. We have always been um, on understanding important in terms of risk management, given the nature of our industry. But we also recognize now that um, it has to go beyond that. It has to go to a situation of enterprise risk management, proper collaboration with, with all the stakeholders to make sure we deal with all the challenges and to make sure we are, sus, uh, we are sustainable as, a, as an organization. I, I, I must make the point is that it's not that it's, everything is, 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 is very great in terms of the airport's authority. We understand that there may be a need for us to in fact review our processes, review what we are doing, review our, our finances, review how we do things in terms of efficiency. And we are taking the opportunity right now, even in the face of the challenges, to deal with those kind of, um, uh, to do that kind of, of, of work, to do that kind of homework. Once again, thank you members. Thank you for putting up with us for the last two, two hours in terms of our, our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. You have showed us that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. So I thank you and your team for giving us that effort. I would like Ms. Dan Mati Ramdat, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Works, to please give us some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee and all my colleagues from Airports Authority as well as Ministry of Health. Um, and I, today, in the last two hours, we have gone through um, the processes and procedures and protocols that both Ministry of Health and Airport Authority would have been implemented. I know in every, as every process, procedure, we do have challenges, we do have gaps. We continue to monitor all processes and procedures to ensure that we put measures in place to alleviate those gaps. And I, that's why I thank you. I'm always grateful for these sessions. We tend to um, use these sessions as learning for us so that if in case uh, we did not uh, see um, maybe somebody else's point of view and uh, we 
we are cognizant of their views from these sessions. We, um, we learn from it and we try to improve. So I want to thank you, Chair, and your committee members. I also would like to give uh, use this forum to thank the Ministry of Health, because I must share with you that uh, one of my relatives was uh, um, came in through um, the repatriation and went through their 14 days quarantine. And uh, um, CMO, I need to thank your staff, your doctors, your nurses at the UE campus. I am telling you, they did a tremendous job um, in taking care of the persons who were under quarantine. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to chair to thank the Ministry of Health and their team. So thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Ramdad. And now I'd like to ask Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, to give us some closing remarks. Yeah, I, I think um, just to simply say that um, thanks to, to the Chair and the members for, you know, shedding some light on, on an area that is often neglected for many, many years. Um, I think Port Health and even Public Health in general has been a sort of neglected science. COVID-19 has brought to, to light um, in terms of public health what has has been unseen for many years. Um, and really the resources have been coming to public health to, to increase our capacity, increase, improve our structures and improve our procedures to such a great extent in a short period that COVID-19 has really greatly um, built, allowed us to build capacity very quickly um, and strengthen our systems even beyond COVID. So this um, joint select, I think even sheds further light on what we do at Port Health and the importance of Port Health and really Thanks to the members um, and the chairman for allowing Ministry of Health to be part of it. And of course, we will take the recommendations forward to streamline our processes even further. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Parasram. And I'm saying that um, you did an excellent job before. And I'm sure with this new flash COVID that's spread it fast, I'm sure you would also, with your uh, committee, um, put us in a safe position. So thank you. Much. So at this stage, I would like to adjourn this meeting, and I would like to um, thank the members of the AATT, Ministry of Work and Transport, the Ministry of Health for your contribution of today's proceeding, proceedings. I'd like to thank the committee members who participated in this uh, virtual hearing. I'd like to thank the staff of the parliament for their procedural and logistical support, uh, Mr. Julian Ogilvie and Keisha Peterkin. And I'd also like to thank the viewing and listening audience and also those who actually participated by sending questions while this procedure was going on. So I now declare this meeting adjourned. Good day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bye. Thank you, Chairman. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Chairman. Have a good day. Okay, good day to all. Keep safe. Wear your mask. Bye.